Welcome to uh, Leading with Gratitude Live. I'm your host, Chester Elton, the Apostle of Appreciation. And we're coming to you live from the new Gratitude Viral Epicenter of Summit, New Jersey. Now, we say, give us 30 minutes. We'll give you great information, great inspiration, and a personal roadmap for you to create a culture of gratitude at work and at home. All brought to you on all kinds of fun platforms, LinkedIn Live, YouTube, Facebook, all brought to you by the wonderful people at Methods Network. Well, today our guest is Whitney Johnson, and I've known Whitney for a while now. Let me tell you just a little bit about this amazing woman. She is the CEO of WLJ Advisors and one of the top 50 leading business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50. She's an expert on helping high growth organizations develop high growth individuals. Whitney is an award-winning author, world-class keynote speaker, Get this, she has 1.7 million followers on LinkedIn, where she was selected as one of the top voices in the world in 2018. She is an author, a best-selling author of Build an A-Team, Play to Their Strengths and Lead Them Up the Learning Curve, and critically acclaimed book, one of my favorites, Disrupt Yourself. Um, I, I love Whitney. She is a mom. She is a business person. She's a best-selling author. She's a global guru. I met her at the MG100. She really is a dear friend of mine. We met at the MG100, Marshall Goldsmith. I have my grandson down at my feet here. This is what you do when you broadcast from home. Welcome to the broadcast, Whitney. We are being disrupted everywhere possible today. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. Well, I think you should have your 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 grandson say hello. What's what's his name? His name is Lucas, and he is hiding from his grandma, and she's trying to put his pants on. I mean, literally, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> this is fantastic. And, oh, it's so fun. You're right. We are just getting disrupted, right? So you got your grandson in there. You completely distracted me because you had this montage beforehand that I had not seen. And then we started late because we couldn't get our technology to work. Disruption is everywhere, isn't it? This was the perfect time to have you on the show. And by the way, for those of yes. you that are listening and tuning in, uh, we're going to take a lot of questions. We've got our friend Justin Levere in the Question Command Center. I know you're going to have a lot of questions for Whitney. They wave to the crowd there, Justin, in his L.A. Dodgers cap. <laughs> and uh, we want to take a lot of questions because we have been disrupted like never before. So, you know, my first question is, you know, in this unprecedented time of disruption, um, what are you telling people about how to cope with the virus and, and this disruption? I, I know you've been inundated. What are you telling people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's actually very simple. I'm telling people that the best way to manage through disruption, the best way to manage through change is to disrupt yourself. And what do I mean by that? Well, we all think of disruption as it's a term that was popularized by Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. And he was my mentor. And I am so grateful for him that I got to learn from him. But it's this idea that a silly little thing can take over the world like the telephone did to the telegraph, kind of like this virus is doing right now to the world. But there's this personal element as well, is that you yourself can become a silly little thing. Um, you can become like um, the telephone and the telegraph. You can become like Netflix was to Blockbuster. The big difference with personal disruption is you are disrupting you. And so you're making a decision that whatever it is I'm doing today, I can do it differently in the next hour, I can do it differently tomorrow. And if we will disrupt ourselves rather than drowning in the disruption that we're experiencing or even rocking back and forth in the swell of the wave of disruption, we'll find a way to surface surface we'll find a way to surf it because we um because uh, we're basically saying you know i am here to act and not be acted upon and that's what i mean when we disrupt ourselves we're basically saying i will act 
Excellent. Do, do you set up certain triggers for yourself every day? You know, our, our dear friend Marshall Goldsmith talks about triggers, reminders. Do you do you decide like every day, I'm going to do this a little differently. I'm going to do that a little differently. Do you have triggers to help disrupt your day so that you're doing things a little differently? Oh, such a great question. So every day, um, well, not every day, but I try to um, at the end of each day to reflect and say, and even if, if I'm having a really good day in real time, be like, okay, what did I just do that worked? So if I had a call and it went well, I'll make a note of it so I can reinforce what's working well. And then in the evening, I'll look at instances where I got triggered, but not in the good sense, in the bad sense. And like, <laughs> why did I get triggered? What happened? And what do I want to do differently? How do I want to rewrite the script? because you get triggered because there's something sort of some script in there that is usually pretty negative and then in the morning what I'll do is I'll have I'll get up and I for example I have a goal that every day I'm up by 6 30 lots of times it's earlier but I do that because then even on Saturday and Sunday I can get up by 6 30 and then I'll make notes of things that I want to say like I learned from BJ Fogg in his Tiny Habits book. I'll put my feet on the floor and say, today is going to be a great day. And then right now, because there's so much going on, I'll say to myself, I will be able to get done everything that is expedient. So, and I say kind of a little yeah. prayer of like, okay, help me to know what it is I need to get done today. Because it's so easy. There's so much that we could be doing. And that's one of the ways that I'm able to sort of have these little things that I definitely do get up by 630. Today's going to be a great day. I'll do some sort of meditation or prayer. And then I'll have two or three things that I'll just kind of repeat to myself throughout the day in order to center myself so that I can not allow the day to disrupt me, but I'm disrupting and I'm finding a way to every day be better than I was the day before. You know, I love those quick little questions, those those little things that you do. Put your feet on the floor, you know, get up at 630. Um, I, I, I love those little triggers. Well, you know, we've got a lot of business people that listen to, to, to this broadcast and they're mm -hmm. saying, well, I don't want everybody in my organization to be disrupting everything every day. That's, you know, that's the sort of the definition of chaos. Right. So how do you create a culture where it is safe to disrupt? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, I mean, you're, you're hitting on a really important point because one of the things that we need to be able to do is in order to disrupt, you need to also, you know, in order to set sail to a ship, you, there also need to be harbors. You need to have, it, there needs to be a both and. And if you think about um, one of the things, the frameworks that we have developed is this S curve of learning, which was the S curve was popularized by E.M. Rogers in 1962. Well, we reimagined the S curve to help us understand how people learn and how they grow and how they develop. And one of the things that we're finding right now and can also happen in an organization is that certainly right now, we're all at the launch point. We're all at the low end of that S curve. And um, But in, in a regular organization on a team, you've got some people who are at the launch point of that S curve, some people who are in the sweet spot of the S curve, some people are at the high end of that S curve. And there are different roles that, you know, as you're structuring and building a team, you're going to have at any given time, a few people who are at the launch point who have just disrupted themselves. But you've got about 70% of your people who are in the sweet spot where they're, they're, they're moving things forward, but they're also stabilizing things. And you've got people at the high end who are going to eventually jump, but they are very very much the, the stabilizing and anchoring force inside of the organization. So there is a time to disrupt and then there's a time to sort of a time to set sail, if you will, and a time to, to be the harbor. <laughs> I love that analogy of the safe harbor. <laughs> Everybody needs a safe harbor, especially now. Well, you know, the thing I love about your work is it, it truly is universal. I mean, you've literally done this all over the world, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I was just thinking, so my last book I launched, um, Build an A-Team in May of 2018. So about two years ago. And when I did, I went over to India and I got to launch it there. And I was just thinking, I don't know what made me think of this, but I got to go to the Taj Mahal. Oh, I know why. Because we were watching on TV, Belgravia. It's like the the, the younger <laughs> sister to Downton Abbey. And um, they were okay. talking about going to India and seeing the Taj Mahal. And I was just thinking, oh, how wonderful. It, it was such an exciting experience to be there. So yes, the short answer to your question is I have taught this, the frameworks of personal disruption all over the world. Because, you know, we, we have quite an international audience today. We've got people tuning in from Fiji. How great is that? Saudi Arabia, oh. Canada, Peru, Finland, Brazil, Cameroon, 
and I'm sure somebody from New Jersey, which of course is my home state. Um, really quick, and Justin, in the question command center, you know, let, let's see if we can stump our damsel of disruption here, Whitney Johnson. What have you got for us? I think the person watching uh, there in New Jersey is probably somebody in your family, Chester. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we've got some good stuff flowing in here. And speaking of a, an international audience, uh, Abraham Patel from Mumbai has written in and is asking, what is, what does he say here? Uh, is innovation the same thing as disruption? Oh, oh good question. that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I would say that disruption is a subset of innovation. So there's lots of different kinds of innovation. There's the but the kind of innovation that I'm talking about or the disruptive innovation that I'm talking about is, as I said, that decision to become a silly little thing so you can take over the world. And if you think about it kind of on a piece of graph paper, you're you're basically here in your life or in your company and you're going over one, up one, over one, up one steadily. And when you disrupt yourself, you're making that decision to move from here down to here. So on this Y axis of success, because you believe that over time it will be over one, up three or over one, up five. And what's fascinating about the experience that we're all having right now is that we were here at 10 and we're now at eight. And so the question is we didn't have to make the decision. We didn't get to choose. We were just all disrupted. The question we all need to ask and answer for ourselves is, what will I do? Will I put in place the behaviors, the actions that allow me to be over one, up three, or over one, up five? It's it's a very difficult time, but it's also a very exciting and, and thrilling time if we will let it be that. Interesting. You know, um, in this time of disruption, too, I think in your culture, you know, when you're being disrupted, whether it's from the virus or a competitor or whatever, is this idea of emotionally keeping yourself in check, right? My dad had this great uh, saying, he said, you know, you have to choose to be offended. And I always I always love that yes. because, you know, it's 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 easy to be offended when things are being disrupted, isn't it? Talk a little bit about your emotional, you know, how you need to keep yourself in, or do you need to keep yourself in check emotionally during a period of disruption? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it all starts here. I, I remember a couple of years ago, I had this experience of like, I was thinking about how I was moving things forward and speaking of disruption, sort of over one, up one. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting these results, but I want to get better results. And I realized that what I needed to do is understand what is going on inside of, inside of our brain. And one of the things that we find happening right now, and I think what your dad said is so true, we can choose to be offended. And you can think about right now, we have this thing, this sort of contest going on in our brain between fear and hope. And we can choose to be fearful. We can choose to think um, to drown in disruption. We can choose to think the world's coming to an end, or we can choose to have hope. We can choose to continue to plant cherry trees. We can continue to invest in the future. I love what John Maynard Keynes said. He said the social object of all investment is to defeat fear. And one of the simple, simple ways you can do that is, is speaking of our mind is right now, everybody listen, just say to yourself, I am hopeful for the future. And you will find that if you say that, and you could say the opposite, but I don't want you to, in that moment when you say, I'm hopeful for the future, you will feel physically different. And that is a choice that you are making um, to move forward through what is happening right now. So it all starts here. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, we, you know, we have a saying, we say gratitude attracts gratitude. And really that positive mindset helps to yes. attract positive mindset. Doesn't it? Well, listen. So, uh, so yeah. Justin, that that wasn't as tough a question as I know Whitney can answer. So, give us a really tough one. What have you got at the question command center? Okay, let's do that. Uh, I've got one for you. So, uh, thirty minutes ago, an hour ago, we were all on a live broadcast with Marshall Goldsmith and Dr. Jim Kim, who is the former uh, president of the World Bank and is currently uh, vice chairman of Partners in Health. So, I'm going to tee one up for you here because I know you were both uh, viewing that particular live broadcast. Um, you know, there was something that was said, um, let's see here, great, this, this pandemic requires great leadership from everyone is a, a statement that Dr. Kim said. And what I'd like you to do is maybe talk about the uh, simple but not easy disruption that Jim Kim and his partners in health are doing and that we can all do, uh, whether that's with partners in health, uh, but what we can do from 
uh, personal standpoint in this time of disruption? Tougher for you? Yeah. Uh, it is tougher. <laughs> um, first of all, and, and, and Chester, you can help out. But I mean, first of all, it was so inspiring. Um, you know, Dr. Jim Kim, he, as Justin was saying, was partners in health and and has done some really, really good work in, in beating back um, viruses and pandemics and epidemics, etc. And so um, some of the things that he mentioned, and I was especially inspired to do is to, first of all, just demand, demand from our leaders that they do something about this, that he talked about how, you know, we're using a bazooka to solve the financial crisis, and we're using a squirt gun to solve the public health crisis. And yet, if we don't solve the public health crisis, the financial crisis will continue to perpetuate. And that was really powerful to me that we need to demand. And for me, what does demand look like? I thought, well, First of all, I'm tweeting or not LinkedIn-ing. I'm not sure what you say, but I thought I need to reach out to my senator. I need to reach out to my governor and um, say something to them about this. There are other things they suggested we can do is um, is donate money. And I think that's all. Even if we donate $5 or $10, we're saying we see you. We appreciate you. Please keep going. This research is very, very important. And then the other thing I thought is, oh, partners in health, they need volunteers. They need people to come work for them. And so I sent that link along to my son who doesn't have a internship because no college age kids have internships, <laughs> but as an also a vehicle for him to do something that he could volunteer. So I found it incredibly inspiring and uplifting. And I think at a very more sort of fundamental level is just, you know, you sometimes don't know what leadership looks like, but when you listen to Jim, you don't know how to describe leadership, but when you listen to Jim Kim talk, you're like, that is a leader, look no further. Right. I actually, it was funny while he was talking, I had the same impression. I actually looked up leader in the dictionary and there was a picture of Jim Kim. I mean, it was that simple. <laughs> he really is amazing. I, I do love where he, he doesn't just give you the ideas, right? He says, there's a call to action, volunteer, give money, call your senator. You know, it seems to me so interesting that for much of this, yeah, we've been isolating in place or whatever you want to call it. And we sit here and we just hope things are going to get better. And I love the old saying, you know, hope is not a strategy, right? It, we're, we're, you know, well, pray for a miracle. Okay, I, I, I can do that. Yeah. Wouldn't it be better if I volunteered and went, went door to door? I love the idea of when disruption hits, step back and say, what can I do? You know, how can I help? Mm -hmm. So it brings me to my next question for you, Whitney, is how have you dealt with the disruption in your family life? Because it's not just a disruption mm -hmm. professionally. It's clearly a disruption right. in our families. Kids aren't going to school. They're at home. You know, we noticed that just people were eating more. You know, my son would come over and just clean us out <laughs> of food. So, so what are some of the ways that you've handled the disruption in your in your family during the virus? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we have two children. We have a son who's in college and we have a, a daughter who is taking a gap year and then she's going to University of Virginia. So that hasn't changed much for her. I think the one place that we've definitely seen this is with our son who's in college and, and the college ended early. And um, he stayed there and is coming home in the next couple of days, but really trying to figure out for, you know, for young people or young adults who are, you know, 20 and 22 and 24 is being able to be in a place where we say to them, okay, we understand that this is hard because you're not sure what to do with yourself. You had a plan and now that plan's not going to work. And at the same, you know, learn to have empathy as well as then say, so now what are you going to do? One of the things I said to him, and I will say to any young person who will listen to me, is I think that we're in a really interesting moment where you may not be able to get a job this summer, um, and so which means you won't be able to earn any money, but you can go volunteer and not earn any money and have an experience that will really make a difference for you and for the people around you. And I I wonder, I don't know, but I, I, I think that during wars in the past, World War II, certainly people would ask things like, well, where were you? What did you do during the war? And I do think that that question will also get asked. What did you do? How did you contribute um, during the COVID-19 pandemic? You know, I, I love what you're saying there because it's a legacy play, right? What will your legacy be? What will you be remembered for? 
And to the point of leadership is great leaders are forged in hard times, not good times. It's easy to be a leader yes. when everything's yes. going great, right? What do you do when things right. are going badly? Well, Justin, let's go back to the question command center. What's your, what's our next question for, <laughs> for our damsel of <laughs> disruption? All right, the question's gonna keep Indeed. getting harder, Justin, or? You better believe it. Go. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll tee up a softball <laughs> one. Just this, this, this one's for you, Whitney. It's going to come from a friend, Gary Ridge. Okay. Our past guest and our good friend is watching live right now, oh, and he Gary. has a question specifically for you, Whitney. It says, "Okay, okay." I think uh, disruption is a pivot opportunity. What do you think? Oh. Absolutely. Okay. So first of all, for everybody who's listening, Gary Ridge is featured prominently in my book, Build an A-Team, because he is a person who makes disruption possible inside of their company. And as a consequence, Gary, you're probably going to be mad at me that I'm saying this, but they under Gary, oh yes, there you are, WD-40. <laughs> under Gary's leadership, everybody, their market cap, I don't know what it is right this second, but it increased tenfold from 250 million US dollars to 2.5 billion US dollars. So significantly outperforming the S&P 500 because he allowed people to disrupt themselves. Okay. Now to answer the question, yes, absolutely a hundred percent. So one of the first accelerants of personal disruption is to take the right kinds of risks, to play where no one else is playing, to figure out ways to create rather than compete. And when everything is discombobulated, the rules do no, no longer apply. There are lots of lots of spaces where there's no competition. And so the question comes, do we just sort of hunker down and batten down the hatches or do we sort of look and say, huh, there's a problem that needs to be solved. And I've got these strengths, I've got these abilities that I could use and put to work on this. Am I going to go create something? And so, yes, it's absolutely an opportunity to pivot. You've already been disrupted. So now that's the hard part. Now you can pivot and go do something new and really take stock of your skills, take stock of what you want to do. Um, you may have lost your job. I've lost my job. I've been fired. And here's what I have found. Most people, when they have lost their jobs, they've said to themselves, you know, I knew it was time for me to jump from that S curve. I knew it was the wrong S curve and I wouldn't do it. So the universe gave me a nudge. You've gotten the nudge. Now, what are you going to do? Yeah. I, yeah. I, nobody does it better than Gary Ridge. And a lot of people don't know this. There actually is WD-40 travel size. I just want to throw that out for you. If you've got a squeaky <laughs> wheel and you get to travel again, there is WD-40 travel size. Well, listen, if we were to sum up, you know, we love to give people tools. So if you had three tips that you wanted to give people about how to continue to disrupt yourself, because, you know, with the speed of business, we've got to continue to reinvent ourselves to continue to look for those new markets. If you were to boil it down to three things that could help our, our listeners and our viewers to help to continually reinvent and disrupt themselves, what would those three things be? Okay. So I would say number one is um, recognize that disruption is about taking a step back to slingshot forward. And so um, one, we've all taken lots of steps back right now, but you can also take that daily step back like we talked about and to reflect, um, look at what's working, um, double down on what's working, but then also look at what didn't work and how can you iterate around that. So that's tip number one, <sighs> tip number one. Tip number two is to look at what your strengths are. One of the things that we find um, is that we don't actually know what our strengths are. There's, they come so easily to us. They're so reflexive. We actually can't see them. They're a blind spot. Um, one of the things that will happen for you right now is because we're all under stress in a way that we haven't been um, collectively, your strengths are going to start to pop their head. And so when you see those strengths, say, aha, I see you. I'm going to use you more deliberately. And one of the ways you'll know what that strength is, is look and listen to the compliments that people give you that you dismiss. Those are always a sign of your superpower. You ignore them, you dismiss them, but lean into that superpower. And then finally, I would say, third tip is to remember what I said, play where no one else is playing, always look for ways to create rather than compete. In a situation like we're in right now, resources feel scarce. It feels like there's not enough of everything. That's sort of from a biological perspective. And so there's the tendency to start to hoard and, and try to not 
um, to, to, to compete what, is what I mean. Instead, I want you to focus on what can you create as a person, even if it's today is going to be a great day. So those would be the three tips. Step back to slingshot forward, focus on what your strengths are, be aware of them, double down on them, and finally focus on creating rather than competing because amateurs compete and professionals create. Excellent. Great, great tips. So listen, so where can people find more about your work and, and buy your books? And, and you've got to tell them about your amazing podcast, Disrupt Yourself. I, I listen to it all the time and you have the most amazing guests. So give us a couple of three or four or five or 10 places where we can find you. <laughs> Okay, well, I think the first place is if anybody who's listening, they're thinking, oh, I want to understand those seven, seven accelerants of disruption better. Um, we have a download that you can just go to WhitneyJohnson.com forward slash calm. So C-A-L-M, calm amidst the chaos. And those have podcasts and books and TED Talks that you can listen to that will help with that. And then I would say secondarily, Chester, you talked about our podcast. You can also just, you can find it anywhere. It's the Disrupt Yourself podcast. And Chester was a guest and he told this amazing story about the prodigal son, which you can come and listen to. We've had Gary Ridge on the podcast. We've had Brene Brown and Simon Sinek. So some amazing guests and um, would love to have you come and listen and, and just hear what your thoughts are after uh, listening. And episode 153 in particular is talking about how do you disrupt yourself in times of a pandemic. Excellent. And don't forget, build an 18. You, you know, you can get that on Amazon, find bookstores everywhere. Make sure you get that. Big fan. That's my copy. Signed, by the way. Well, listen, this is a delight to have you on the show. You know, it, never before has there been more need for how do you how do you just cope with all this disruption? And you are, without a doubt, the damsel of disruption. So thank you so much. I have one last question for you. Where did you find yes. your gratitude today? Oh, I have so many places that I found it. Um, first of all, this is fun. This I feel grateful for this conversation with you, Chester. Um, second of all, as we were trying to get online, um, we were having lots of technical difficulties. And so Brent on uh, Chester's team, our actual colleague, was able to come in and troubleshoot. I was grateful for that. Another thing I was grateful for is a person on my team. I'm doing a podcast interview this afternoon with David Peterson, who some of you know, who's a colleague of ours. And she helped me prep my questions very grateful for that. And then finally, the thing I think sort of most inspiring today was listening to Dr. Jim Kim. I was just really grateful no and very moved by him and his leadership and what he is doing to um, make a difference in our world. And he really helped me want to step up. And so I'm very, very grateful for having been able to hear him. Excellent. You are the best. You are an amazing mom. You're an amazing wife. You're an amazing thinker. And you know what? I'm proud to call you one of my amazing friends. So thank you so much, Whitney. You're the best. Aww. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> hey, listen, our, our next guest is going to be as, as amazing. We've got the Colonel Nicole Malinowski. She's the first female pilot to fly with the Thunderbirds. She's a retired Air Force Colonel in the United States Air Force. She's going to talk to us about resilience. Don't miss it. The B-roll is going to be amazing. She is beyond delightful. So that'll be our next 30 minutes. You know, you give us 30 minutes, we're going to give you amazing information. We're going to give you inspiration. And we're going to give you that roadmap to create your own personal culture at work and at home of gratitude. You know, I, I love during the pandemic things that are happening. And I'd say, listen, be more grateful. You know, be more kind and be more patient. You know, if you want to see any of these past broadcasts, we're going to rebroadcast actually Marshall Goldsmith and Jim Kim's broadcast later today. Uh, you can find it all on the methods network forward slash or methodsof.com forward slash network. Always, I want to give a shout out to the uh, commander of our question command center, Justin Lavere. Wave to the crowd. We couldn't do it without you, even though you are a Dodgers fan. And, uh, and the world's greatest... <laughs> the world's greatest producer online without question, Brent Klein. We, we were so disrupted today. You know, the orange beanie, you gotta love it. So be grateful, be kind, be patient. We'll see you on our next show. Same bat time, same bat channel. Thank you, Methods Network. You guys are amazing. Be safe. Don't forget, wash your hands. We're out. Cheers. Mm -hmm.